know we'll start in just a minute, but it is a tradition in the Kafka community, in the streaming community, to do streaming selfies, especially when I have such a wonderfully packed room. Um, so smile for the camera, everybody, <laughs> and thanks for being here. All right. Now that that's out of the way, we have 30 seconds before we start. Um, there's still some seats if you're looking for a seat. Um, oh, and it gets so quiet so quickly. All right, well then I guess we'll get started. It's 10.30 now. Um, they knew what they were doing when they put me first because I'm very loud and you will all be awake. Um, although, you've had ice cream, so you're definitely awake now. I'm very jealous of you, sir. Um, I have to go get that afterwards. Um, but welcome, thank you for being here for the very first set of sessions at JSpring. I'm, I'm very glad to be here as well. It's my first time uh, speaking at this conference. Um, so, my name is Danica Fine. I am a developer advocate at Confluent, uh, which means that I really like to talk about Kafka. Um, and so, if you want to learn more about Kafka later, I am more than happy to keep talking for the entirety of the day, actually. I could keep going. Um, but today, you are here to learn how to get data out of Kafka. Effectively, really. Um, but how many of you are using Kafka right now? Okay, those of you who didn't raise your hands, you're gonna learn so much today about when you do use Kafka later. Um, but all of you who raised your hands, you, you probably know already how to get data out of Kafka, um, but do you know how it gets out of Kafka? I think that's the, those sound like very similar things, but they're quite different, uh, ultimately. Um, so in this session, we are going to dive into the depths of the uh, consumer and broker internals and see how your client code actually fetches all of that wonderful data for you in real time. Um, and so just to make sure we're all on the same page, um, to get data out of Kafka, we should probably have a topic that we want to consume from. Um, and if you could not tell by the title, um, this is a very dense subject matter. So I like to have fun with my talks at, at the very basic level. So uh, this is Hobbit themed, all right? So buckle up. Uh, we're going to throw some, some references in there where we can. Um, so the data that we are trying to consume is uh, housed in this Hobbit updates topic. And so we have an associated schema because we're not monsters. So we're good people, so we use schemas. And so the schema, very basic, we just want to know the whereabouts of hobbits. So their name, um, where they currently are, and their status. They don't do very many different things, so it's a pretty simple schema. Um, I've, I've, for the completion, I've put a couple of configurations up there from the topic that we are consuming from, but the most important one here is a number of partitions in that topic, which is six, all right? So we can imagine we've had some producer clients writing to that topic. We have a lot of data that we want to consume from. Um, and so we have this topic we want to read from. We have the schema so we can deserialize that data. Um, now we can set up a consumer in whatever language we want, right? It's pretty flexible, probably Java though. Um, and in that code, then we will issue a consumer.pull. Right? And then, you know, bam, all right, the data magically shows up on the consumer client for us. We're done, you can all leave. Um, it almost feels like magic. You know, I love when Kafka just works, right? When the data just shows up or you throw it in there, you get it back out. Um, but Kafka is a very complex technology, right? And it's a black box. You, you toss things into it, you get it back out, hopefully. Um, what happens in between is something that, thankfully, we as application developers don't really have to think about very often, gratefully, right? Uh, until something goes wrong. <laughs> and then you think about it a lot, <laughs> especially if you're like, you know, racking your brains trying to figure out why it is not doing the thing that you want it to do. And so we're going to help future you in this talk uh, when you inevitably hit that hurdle the next time you write uh, a consumer client. So we're going to jump into the depths of that black box. All right, we are going to, ah, why is this showing up there? Aha, there we go, better. Um, we are going to follow that call to consumer.pull and as it journeys into the depths of the darkest corners of the broker and emerges victorious with that data that we want, all right? So this is the journey we're gonna go on throughout the session. It's a lot, uh, just bask in the glory that is everything that happens every time you make a request to your brokers. It's amazing, it's incredible that it works. Um, so every consumer fetch request is going to flow through all of these stages on the broker before it comes back to us uh, with a formulated response, hopefully with that data that we want, okay? And we're gonna get into all these stages individually, and I know it seems like a lot to cover in just a short 40 minutes, but I promise we'll do it. Um, but what might surprise you is that for as many of these stages there are on the broker that we need to go through, there's actually just as much that happens on the consumer before and after we do all those stages, right? There's a lot of uh, intricacies and nuances there as well that we're going to dive into. And so this actually 
aligns pretty well with uh, me comparing this, these uh, requests to hobbits on their wonderful journeys, um, because these consumer fetch requests, much like hobbits, are very stubborn. Okay. Um, yes, they're going to go on their journey eventually. We're going to leave the comforts of our home and, and, and uh, make this uh, journey of epic proportions, but not without some preparation, all right? We need to be convinced to leave. Um, and so we're all gonna start, we're gonna start uh, back in Hobbiton on the, the consumer client and prepare to embark on our journey, okay? Because there's a lot that happens here under the hood. Um, so we wanna read our data from our Hobbit updates topic. When we set up a consumer, subscribe to that topic, right? And eventually, we're gonna pull the cluster for that data. Um, but before we can start pulling, we need to, there's a little bit of behind the scenes work that the consumer is gonna do along with the broker to make sure that we can actually make those requests, right? So before anything else, uh, we are going to use the bootstrap servers that we've configured our consumer with, and we are going to initialize our connection with the cluster, right? If you've set up a consumer, you have set bootstrap servers, either uh, an array of the uh, servers or maybe just one, and it's going to use that initial connection to find all of the other brokers in the cluster, and it's going to start receiving metadata from the cluster on, on the other nodes that it's going to need to be connected to. Okay, pretty basic. Um, once we are connected to the brokers, the consumer then enters the pull loop, right, that you have implemented in your client code. Um, but before it can actually start fetching that data, it has a little bit more initializing to do, right? We need a little more information. Namely, you know, we, we know what topics we are subscribed to, but we don't yet know which partitions we should be consuming from, unless you've explicitly uh, set that on your consumer. Um, and so to figure out which partitions we are, have assigned to ourselves as we consume data from this topic, uh, we have a couple more configurations that impact how that happens. Okay, so biggest one here is group ID. So at the very least, uh, when you set up a consumer, you need to subscribe to some topics. So we at a high level know which topic or topics we want to consume from. But as we know, we're, we're not always going to read from every partition in that topic, right? Um, especially if our consumer is part of a consumer group, right? So being part of a consumer group means that we are able to band together a bunch of consumers to parallelize the processing of data uh, from different partitions within a topic or a set of topics, okay? So we do that by enabling a group ID. Um, and a group ID is just a string that you set to be a consistent value across the consumers that you want to be in part uh, in that same consumer group. Um, with the group ID set, this means that the consumer isn't just going to connect to the brokers in, in the cluster, just to, to be aware of those brokers. It's also going to uh, connect to the consumer group coordinator, which might be one of the brokers that it's already connected to as part of the bootstrap servers, or it might be another separate broker that's running that process for us. Uh, so we want to set that string to start uh, kicking off this idea of the consumer group. If we leave group ID empty, which you are free to do, you don't have to explicitly set it all the time, then, well, we're going to give you a random string. We're going to assign you a random uh, group ID to use for the purposes of, of coordinating um, with uh, the cluster, which is completely fine. Right? You can set up just a single consumer to read from a Kafka topic. We don't need to use a full consumer group. That's fine, right? Um, so effectively, you're setting up just a, you know, a singleton in this, in this one group. But know that not setting the group ID explicitly has some ramifications later on when it comes to offset management, right? So namely that since we're assigning it a random string, when that consumer dies inevitably, because it will, something will go wrong, when it comes back up online, it's gonna also be spun up with another random string, okay? So it's not going to be able to find what its offsets were previously, um, which could be bad. It might be fine for your use case. Maybe you don't need to know what your offsets were before. That's okay, uh, but maybe you do. And so don't hit that issue, all right? So it's oftentimes better than not to uh, explicitly set your group ID, even if you do want to use just a single uh, consumer, right? All right, so group ID, we want to band together uh, and have a consumer group for these set of consumers. But next, what else we need to use? If we're using the group ID and we want to have multiple consumers consuming together, um, then the consumer group coordinator needs a little bit more information, right? It needs to know how it should strategize in doling out the partitions to the available consumers in the group, okay? And it's going to use the partition assignment strategy to do this. Um, you've probably seen a lot of these before. Hopefully you are familiar. Um, there's quite a few of them. Um, the first one, the default one for a very long time, was the range assigner. 
okay? Um, the range assigner is really good if you want to join topics um, and join topics that have the same number of partitions and who the data of which ha has been keyed the same. Right, and has been partitioned across those partitions in the same way. Right? Um, so if you want to be able to join the, that, that data, what the range assigner does is it looks at all the partitions for the topics that um, you are consuming from in this consumer group. It lays them all out, you know, zero to N, right? Um, and then it says, okay, we're gonna look at all the zero partitions and we're gonna give those all to consumer zero. All the one partitions, we're gonna give those all to consumer one, and so on and so forth. Okay? It won't evenly distribute all the partitions across the uh, consumers as, as optimally as maybe some of the other assigners could do. Um, but as you can imagine, that's really good if you want to be able to join those topics, right? So you can ensure that for your joins to be completed, you have all the data that you need to potentially do that join right? on a single consumer instance. Okay? Um, and now we have the round robin assigner. Um, so that's kind of what it sounds like, right? It's going to look out all of the topic partitions that we are currently subscribed to in our consumer group. And it's going to take the first topic partition and give it to the first consumer, the second one to the second one, and so on and so forth. All right, we're just gonna keep doling those out. And that one's going to pretty optimally uh, distribute those partitions across all the running consumers in the group. Then to make it a little more interesting, we have the sticky assigner. So um, the sticky assigner also uses effectively the round robin strategy to initially dole out all those partitions. But what the round robin assigner doesn't do uh, that the sticky signer does is that when consumers come up and down in the group, right, and we need to rebalance some of the partitions that have been, um, you know, orphaned as part of, you know, a consumer dying or, you know, coming back up, um, the sticky assigner stops the world, all right? When that happens, when a consumer dies or comes back online, it says, all right, everybody stop. Give me all of your partitions. We wanna see what we've got going on here. We're gonna assess everything. Uh, and it's gonna do a couple co computations based on the consumer that left and the consumer that maybe just joined. It's going to optimally redistribute the partitions in a way that the consumers that don't need to be updated don't need to be updated, right? Uh, if the consumer didn't, uh, didn't die or it isn't a brand new consumer, we're gonna give it its same partitions uh, that it had before, right? So that we don't have to rebalance state or something or reinitialize the consumers. Um, and then just gonna recompute that option uh, distribution of partitions and start everyone again, right? Um, so that's, uh, it's sticky in a sense, right? It's trying to maintain uh, those assignments as best possible. And so finally, we have something newer that's way better, is the cooperative sticky assigner, which does effectively the same thing, but it doesn't want to stop the world, all right? So it does that computation ahead of time uh, for the partition assignments, and then it only stops the consumers who are receiving a new partition assignment. All right, so um, it doesn't use the eager rebalancing of the sticky assigner, it uses cooperative rebalancing uh, as implied by the name, okay? Um, so as far as the defaults right now, we're in a weird sort of transition period where um, cooperative sticky assigner is now, uh, and moving forward should be the, the main default, um, but while we are transitioning off, um, it's a tuple of range assigner and cooperative sticky assigner so that you could potentially go and update all your consumers eventually, right? Good, all right, so. Let's see, when, so we're going to assume that in our application we are joining a consumer group, there's a number of us, and um, we are going to use, you know, round robin or the, you know, the sticky partitioner, right? So remember that our Hobbit updates topic has six partitions, um, and we can imagine that this particular consumer that we're dealing with is consumer zero. Um, and this is just one of han a handful of consumers in the group, three. Um, so if we're, say, uh, using the cooperative sticky uh, partitioner, we've all entered the group, we've reached sort of a steady state here, um, our partitions might be distributed like this, right? We have consumer group, uh, uh, consumer zero receiving partition zero and partition three, um, and the other consumers receiving um, some combination of the others. All right, so we are responsible for two partitions. Cool. Now, what if we wanted to look into our partitioning and what's going on under the hood and, and understand if our consumer group is actually working as it should? Well, we have metrics for that, and we should be looking at these metrics just to make sure everything's running smoothly. Um, so these are all uh, consumer and consumer group level metrics. Um, the first, but only if the group ID is enabled, okay? So again, it would probably behoove you to set those group IDs and understand uh, what your group is. So first we have the assigned partitions, so you can actually check in and make sure that your individual consumer clients are receiving uh, a good number of, uh, or an even number of these assigned partitions uh, relative to the others in the group. 
And then beyond just the partitions and understanding how those are doled out, um, I wanted to include some metrics here for the actual rebalance process, you know, when consumers are added and removed from the group. Um, I think these are some of the most important ones to actually check into to understand if your group is working properly. And so we have the rebalance latency average. Um, so once we, uh, a consumer uh, exits the group or uh, enters the group, uh, we're triggering that whole rebalance process, right? Um, and so this is how long that entire process takes uh, from the perspective of each of these clients. Right. Um, then we also have the rebalance total, right? So over the lifetime of the consumers in this group, um, so this is going to be a monotonically increasing number, you know, for the lifetime of that consumer, uh, to show you how many times that individual client has been a part of a rebalance process. Okay. And so generally, you'd want uh, those the latency and the rebalance total to be as low as possible. Um, to show that, okay, we've reached a steady state and we're not hitting, um, you know, a situation where we have like a rebalance storm where all these consumers are coming up and down all the time, right? Check into your consumer groups, make sure they're healthy, right? And there's a ton more uh, metrics, especially related to the rebalances, but I think that these are sort of the general basic ones that you should check into. All right, so we have bootstrapped, we have determined what topic partitions that we are consuming from, zero and three, um, but that's not enough. Right? We cannot just start uh, pulling the cluster for our data right now. We also need to know where to start from in those topic partitions that we're reading from. Yeah? Um, so if you are unfamiliar, um, offsets are sort of book bookmarks in our Kafka topics. Right? Uh, they uniquely define a, an individual message's place in a topic partition so that the consumer knows in the event that they die and come back up where they've left off. Right? We've already read this message. Great. Start from the next one. Cool. Um, so how does a consumer, a brand new consumer, who um, just received their fresh partition assignment know where to start off from? Well, it issues a fetch request, which is interesting because we haven't gotten to issue a fetch request for the data that we actually want yet, but we can fetch data from an internal Kafka topic uh, called the uh, consumer offsets topic. Um, so when you set your consumer group ID, um, and you have the subscription of the topics and the topic partitions that belong to that consumer group ID, uh, we then have, um, uh, we store the group offsets in the consumer offsets topic. And so the key is a tuple of the group ID and the topic partition. Um, and then we actually store the offset as part of the, the payload of that message. Okay. Um, so we're going to pull based on our topic partitions that we are assigned to, zero and three, and we're going to request that we figure out, okay, what, what have we stored for this group ID before? All right, give that to me. But what if there aren't any offsets in that offset topic, right? What if this is the first time that we're running this application to consume from the Hobbit updates topic, right? That happens pretty frequently, right? Or what if we fetch the data from the offsets topic, but it's been months since we've run this application. And so based on our retention policies in the underlying topic, those offsets aren't valid anymore. They don't exist in that topic, yeah? Um, so this is where auto offset reset comes in. This is my least favorite configuration of <laughs> all of the configs in Kafka, uh, just because I think the name is just not good. It should be auto, off auto invalid offset reset, I think. I'm petitioning for that, so we'll see if I succeed. But um, So auto offset reset only comes into play if there's an invalid reset r uh, offset, meaning that there isn't an offset or the offset is stale. Okay, um, and so in this case, then it's just kind of an override. It tells us, okay, where should we start in the topic now that we don't have a valid offset? Um, it takes uh, just three values. You could put earliest, meaning you want to start at the beginning of the topic. Latest, you want to start at the end. Or none, if you want to just have an exception and crash and burn. Um, or you can catch that exception and then manually set your offsets if you would like to. All right. So as far as metrics that are related to offsets, um, so when, while your consumer is up and running, um, you may want to monitor your consumer lag, meaning that this is the difference between the last stored offset on the broker for that topic partition and the latest committed offset from that consumer group. All right. So you, can, you obviously want this to be as close as possible if you're actually trying to do something in real time. Um, but you also don't want to see that lag getting larger over time. right? You want your consumers to be able to keep up. Okay, So it's good to monitor that. Okay, now, finally we have everything we need to issue a fetch uh, for the Hobbit updates data in that topic, right? Uh, how does this happen? Well, as you've already kind of seen, uh, the consumers are maintaining connections to brokers all the time, right? They're maintaining a number of socket connections to some number of Kafka brokers based on where uh, their topic partitions that they are subscribed to live, 
All right, so at the very minimum, they're going to be connected to those brokers that own the topic partitions they're reading from. Um, and then they'll also be connected to the broker that serves as the consumer group coordinator, right? Just to send heartbeats there and, and receive any metadata they need for the group. All right, and then they're going to send their fetch requests um, using binary protocol over TCP. Cool, so it's request response, right? We are issuing a request to fetch the data. Uh, the brokers will send a response back, hopefully a good response with the data that we requested. Um, and this is the process that actually kicks off the tr first true phase of our journey. We can leave Hobbiton, we can leave our house <laughs> and, and journey on to the brokers. Um, but before you get ahead of yourselves, uh, there are some configurations that affect how this request uh, will be processed later on, okay? So the, the biggest way that you're going to uh, configure these fetch requests is about how much data you want to get back, right? Um, so we have fetch min bytes and fetch max bytes. Um, and so these at a high level just control how much uh, the broker is going to try to uh, send back to us. Um, you should know that fetch max bytes is not a hard maximum. <laughs> and we will get into that uh, later on. And it's also worth noting that in a given request to a broker, it might be that you're trying to fetch multiple partitions worth of data from that broker, okay? So as part of the overall fetch, you might want to limit per partition how much data you receive back on that fetch, and that's done with max partition fetch bytes. Um, but of these three limits, uh, the most important one by far is fetch min bytes because that's actually could potentially hold up how long the broker uh, will take to fulfill a request. Right? And on that note, um, how long it will potentially block is uh, configured with fetch max wait ms. Um, so yeah, the server will actually block uh, to try to fetch uh, the limit of fetch min bytes um, and it will wait up to fetch max wait ms. All right, so um, obviously you will want whatever that fetch max wait ms is to be less than the overall request timeout that you assign to that request folding into the broker. And that uh, request timeout ms is a general uh, con uh, config that you could set for any request. It's not just for fetch requests, it's also for produce requests as well. All right. And this, these could all be set uh, obviously per client, so you can change that per con uh, uh, consumer. All right. So what about metrics? If you want to actually understand if your fetch, uh, fetches are working as they should um, or that your consumer is doing what it should be doing, um, these are good to keep track of. So we have request rate, um, so the number of requests per second that that consumer is actually issuing to the brokers. Um, then we have a fetch latency average. So once we issue the fetch to the, the request to the broker, a timer starts. And so this describes how long that whole process takes to receive a response back. Um, and then finally, we have the average amount of data that's being uh, returned per fetch. It's always good to check into this and see how this relates or how this compares to our mins and our max that we're actually sending uh, along with the request. All right? So it's good to just check in and understand um, how those uh, fetches are performing. Okay. Now, we're going to take this very um, you know, hand-wavy sort of concept of this request, and we're going to make it a little more solid in your mind. Um, so this is effectively what we're sending along to the broker. So we have our partition assignment, we know our offsets that we're going to be reading from, uh, and this is what every fetch request from our consumer, consumer zero, is effectively going to look like. Right? Um, so each request has some metadata associated with it, and this is mostly related to um, all those, uh, those timeouts and limits that we just saw. Okay? Um, so we have the timeout that that request is abiding uh, within, uh, or expecting a response within. Um, so the client, if it doesn't receive a response within this time, um, it's going to either retry or throw an exception. Right? So you have to handle that for yourself. And then we have the fetch limits, the min and max, uh, the partition maxes, um, and how long we're going to wait uh, to block for that fetch. And so note that each request is being sent to a single node or a broker, right? Um, so the assumption here, we're making a couple assumptions, and we got really lucky, is that our partition assignment of zero and three for a Hobbit updates topic, well, both of those partitions live on the same broker. How lucky, that's great. Um, and also, you know, maybe in our application, we need the data on uh, the elves and their updates. So we are consuming from one partition of that data, and that partition also conveniently lives on the same broker. Um, but know that if these partitions lived on different brokers, whatever our assignment is, and it's likely the case that that's going to happen at some point, um, the consumer is just going to issue multiple fetch requests uh, per iteration of its pull loop. All right. Um, so it's important to note here, or I think it's a fun thing to keep track of, um, is that there will only ever be at most one request in flight from this consumer per node. Okay? There could potentially be multiple requests in flight, um, but there's just one per node. Okay, so the consumer is going to wait for that response back before sending another one to that particular broker. <coughs> okay. 
And at this point, we finally left the consumer, <laughs> okay? And now we're gonna go through all the rest of this, but this one's um, a little bit faster. Um, so our hobbit, our hero, has left his cozy hobbit hole, um, which is arguably the most difficult to get a thing to get a hobbit to do. Um, so we're ready to go. We've embarked on the journey. So what's next? Um, so the first uh, stage for any incoming request, um, not just uh, producer, uh, the consumer requests, but also uh, producer requests and replication requests and what have you, um, every request is going to land on the broker in the socket receipt buffer. Okay, um, so it's sort of a landing zone for everything that comes through, and here they're going to wait to be picked up by the network threads for processing. Um, so we've also crossed a very specific threshold in the process here, um, in that you know all the configurations that we saw before, uh, those are pretty much things that you as application developers have control of. Uh, this is the territory of the people, those special few that are operating Kafka clusters. And so I'm going to tell you all these configurations that you could potentially look into at this point, but it could be the case that you need to go yell at someone to change some configs, or they're going to yell back at you and say, no, we're not changing that. So uh, this is mostly just so that you are aware. Um, and it might be that one of these defaults has been changed and causing trouble. But uh, So generally, you won't have to touch these, um, but you, there are some low-level configs to change um, the size of this buffer, um, but the defaults are usually good enough. Usually. I haven't heard of a case where they weren't. Um, all right, so after a very, very short stay on the socket receive buffer, the request is going to be picked up by some available network thread for processing. And an important thing to note here is that whichever network thread actually picks up this request at this point is going to handle that request and response throughout its life cycle on the broker from here on out, okay? You can think of it as the Gandalf of our journey, all right? He's always gonna be there, watching from afar, making sure we're all right. Um, so the first job of the network thread is to read the request from the socket buffer. Um, it's going to form it into an object uh, for the type of request that it is. In this case, it is a fetch request object. Um, and then it's going to add it to the request queue. Cool, done, easy. Um, again, there are some advanced uh, configurations that you can use to uh, tweak this, uh, the network threads at this point. Generally, again, you won't have to change them, but um, num network threads will control how many there are. Uh, the default is three, and the upper bound is just going to be whatever, um, how many cores you have on your machine, right? And you might want to monitor these network threads if someone um, who's operating your cluster isn't already monitoring them. Uh, you can do so with network processor average idle percent. The values range from zero, meaning that the threads are fully utilized, to one, meaning that they're uh, more idle, and you obviously want that to be closer to one. They're healthy. All right, so our request is now on the request queue, and this is another short stint for our hero, our request. Um, and they're going to wait here for further processing by the I.O. threads. And remember, it's not just these requests that are the, the fetch requests that are being added to this queue at this point. There are many other requests coming through the brokers at all times. Um, we're not special. There's other people waiting for stuff, too, on the cluster. Um, so for the request queue, you, again, do have ways to configure uh, the overall size of the request queue using the queued max requests um, and also queued max request bytes. And you would generally, you really want to monitor this queue, okay, and make sure it's behaving properly and that uh, requests are actually flowing through it uh, quickly. Uh, you can monitor it, use, uh, monitoring the queue size and the amount of time that rec uh, requests actually stay in that queue as well. And this is really important, okay, because if this queue is full for any reason, it's going to block. And that's not good, all right? Our Kafka cluster needs to be operating smoothly. Requests need to flow through in a timely manner. Okay, so next, the request is going to be picked up off of the request queue by an available I.O. thread, right? And these are also called the request handler threads for the purposes of the metrics. Um, so since the I.O. threads have a lot of work to do, arguably uh, all of the work to do in fetching the data from disk, you might want to configure how many there are. Um, so you can change the number using them I.O. threads. The default is eight. Um, and then you should also be monitoring how the I.O. threads are performing um, using request handler average idle percent, again, ranging from one, uh, zero to one, and you want that to be closer to one. Okay. All right. Finally. <laughs> the moment you've been waiting for. After all of that, we can fetch the data, or try to fetch the data that we are requesting as part of this fetch request, right? Um, effectively, we're, we're stealing the treasure at this point, right? Um, so uh, the IO threads, again, are the MVPs here. They're taking care of this portion. And if you are familiar with the structure of storage in Kafka, right, it's a log. It's a commit log. Okay. So on disk, that commit log consists of a number of segment files, and those segment files are comprised of a number of files. Um, but we're going to cover uh, two that are very important to us in this uh, particular case. 
the first is the log file. This is the file that contains the raw bytes of event data that we have produced to this topic. Yeah? And then we also have an index file. And the index file, very, very critical for, for all uh, requests flowing through the cluster. Um, so it stores the index structure that maps a record offset to the position of that record in whatever log file it exists in. Okay? So when the IO threads are parsing this request, remember our request contains for a topic partition, uh, which offset we want to start from, and it also ha contains those mins and max that we want to uh, set uh, the chunk of data that we are requesting, right, the size of it. And so the IO threads are going to look at that offset that we have in there, the partition that we are also trying to request from, and they're going to use that offset and the index file to figure out where the you know, starting record is for that range of records we're requesting, and then use that requested size of data that we're trying to fetch back um, and configure the range of records we need to return. Cool. All right. So the IO threads are going to figure out uh, exactly, you know, upfront before it even touches any of the data on the files, uh, what range of data we're trying to send back. All right. And then we can move forward. Cool. So I'm going to take a step back uh, before we move on. Um, one thing you might be asking yourself is, and I know you are, you're asking yourself, uh, where does fetch max bytes come in and why isn't it a hard limit? Great question. I'm so glad you remembered to ask that. Um, so on disk, within the log file, um, Let's think back to our producers, right? If you've ever produced data to Kafka, and I'm hoping that some of you have, maybe you've also batched your data. Maybe, maybe, we like doing that, it's efficient. Um, and so when you batch uh, produce data into Kafka, uh, we are, you know, we're serializing all the data into just a rob, a blob of bytes, right? And when the broker is storing that data, that batch of data on the cluster, it doesn't do anything with it, it just takes the blob and puts it in the file. Cool. It doesn't care how many like records are in it. It doesn't care what the record structure looks like. It just stores it, right? And so it's when we come along and we are requesting a range of data, right? And we get a blob that's much bigger than the range of data we are trying to request. Um, we still want to be able to make progress, right, in our response. So the broker. Um, isn't going to look into that blob of data and deserialize it and try to make it smaller and just send a subset of records back, right? Uh, it's going to grab the whole blob if it needs to and say, all right, here it is, go. And it's going to give it back to the consumer like that. Uh, so that's why it's not a hard limit, right? We still want to be able to make progress for all of the fetch requests that come through, regardless of whether we have previously batched before. Okay, so it's going to send that whole chunk of data back and not respect the hard limit. Because it's better to make progress than hold up an entire consumer process because they made a silly, uh, put a limit on there. All right, um, and the same thing's going to happen if we set the max partition fetch amount to be uh, too low. That's also a soft limit there. All right. So good question, everybody. <laughs> now you know. Um, all right. So we're still at the I/O threads, and they are uh, locating, you know, where this range of data is that we should be sending back. Okay. And at this point, one of the following things has happened: that it has it has computed. Um, either it has computed the full range, and we know where it is. Right. Um, it knows exactly which segment file on disk, or better yet, in page cache, because we're trying to do it in real time, and it's still in page cache. Um, it knows where that entire range of data is that we're requesting. And in which case, it's ready to formulate a response. We're good. Send it back. Done. Right? Um, or maybe the data exists on uh, tiered storage. Right? It also knows, based on its, uh, um, um, its index file, if the data is off in tiered storage, if we've offloaded it to colder, cheaper storage. Um, in which case, it's going to pass off the, uh, the request to the tiered fetch threads so that they can actually go access it for us. Okay? In which case, we're almost ready to go. Right? Or maybe it's that. Um, you know, we've computed where this range should be, and oh no, we haven't actually satisfied the minimums for this fetch request, right? Fetch um, min bytes has not actually been, um, you know, we haven't passed that, that limit, okay? So in that case, we don't want to send anything back yet because we could potentially wait, yeah? So while we're waiting to try to get to fetch min, um, we are going to drop off the unfulfilled request in purgatory. I love it. I love that we call it purgatory. It just sounds so existential. Um, so purgatory, which is what it's actually called, uh, is a math-like da data structure that's based on a hierarchical timing wheel. Super fun. That's fun. Are you serious? Nice. Thanks, guys. I guess I'll authenticate. You know, this has never happened to me before. I mean, it happens every day, but not like during a talk. <coughs> Give me a moment. Are you serious? Wow, wow. Uh, 
Uh, I know, it's coming for me. Okay, we're good, we're good. We're gonna edit that out of the video, probably, maybe. Uh, anyway, we're, all, we're having fun here. Um, <laughs> so, um, hierarchical timing wheel, where we put all unfulfilled requests, right, before we're ready to send back a response. Um, so in this case, we are either waiting for the min amount of time, uh, min amount of data to come through to respect that minimum that we had wrong with the fetch, or we're waiting for that maximum amount of time to pass, right, in which case we won't send anything back, we'll just move on. We'll, we'll send back an empty response, okay? So, if the request needs to spend a little bit more time in purgatory, and then maybe we, you know, we get all the data that we need to, or maybe we don't, um, regardless, at this point, we are ready to send some sort of response back. Either we've determined the entire range of data, and we have it, we're ready to go, or we're sending nothing back, I'm so sorry. Um, but now we're ready to formulate that response, and we can put it on the response queue. Okay, um, you can't configure the response queue like you can the incoming request queue, um, but you can monitor it with similar metrics just to make sure and see how long these responses are hanging around there. All right, so back to the network threads. Well, you know, they've been with us the whole time, right? Just like Gandalf. Um, so at this point, it's time for the network threads to pick up that generated response um, and send it back to uh, the consumer client. And then finally, all right, that outgoing response is then copied to the socket send buffer uh, to await being received by the consumer. Um, and an important thing I do want to call out here is that you know, there's a lot of data always in movement in the brokers, right? Between these res incoming uh, requests um, and outgoing responses and producing and, and fetching. Um, and so it'd be very inefficient and very unfortunate if we were always copying the full payload of data along with these responses as we're building them up, right? Um, and so uh, Kafka is, is actually zero copying this data from disk or um, from the, uh, the, the fetch threads when it comes in from tiered storage. Um, so it's doing a zero copy wherever it can, okay, just to avoid um, uh, moving too much data at once, right? Um, and uh, yeah, so again, we have some uh, low-level configurations here. You can control the size of this outgoing buffer if you want, um, and then you can also check and see how long it's actually taking for the consumer to receive this actual payload using response send time and us, all right? Okay. Now we're back on the consumer with a full payload of data, hopefully. Um, but we're not done yet because this is where the fun really begins because now we get to process this data. Okay? Um, and remember that bo brokers only speak in bytes, right? So whatever data we've received back is just a blob of, of bytes. Um, so our first thing we have to do is take that payload from the response um, and deserialize it into something that we can actually do something with, right? Thankfully, we have a schema, so we can set up a deserializer uh, using that schema. Um, so at this point, to configure this, you're going to use the key deserializer or the value deserializer. Maybe you're also connecting to schema registry to keep track of your schemas as well, um, but there's a number of configs for that. And then we can actually start to pull the records, right? Because you implement that wonderful pull loop and you, act, you implement your business logic there, right? We do the processing. Um, that's great. But one thing, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna be a little hand wavy there because you're doing that. I don't care what you do with your records once you get your records. Um, but I wanna call out one particular nuance here because I think it was pretty confusing to me. Um, fetch and pull, those are very different things, right? I feel like in, in my mind, uh, those two words feel the same, but they are very much not the same, right? The behavior that we saw uh, with the consumer actually issuing a fetch request to bring back data, um, that's a separate process entirely from what actually happens during every iteration of the pull loop that you are implementing. It is not necessarily the case that every time you reach the top of that pull loop that we are fetch sending a fetch request, right? So whenever a, fetch a response comes back from a fetch, we are caching the result of that, okay? Um, so it might be quite a bit of data, it might be quite a few records uh, that come back, thousands uh, even, uh, depending on the size of your records. Um, and the, cons the consumer is going to cache uh, the result of that fetch, and then we're going to pull them in even increments, okay? So, um, after which, uh, when it exhausts that cache, it's going to issue another fetch to that broker, okay? And why would it do this? <laughs> Um, well, first of all, the even increments that we are actually processing at each iteration of the pull loop uh, is controlled by max pull records. Uh, the default is 500, and so this puts a limit directly on how many records that we could potentially see per iteration of the pull loop, right? Why bother setting that, right? Why bother setting that if way more records potentially came in as a result of that fetch request? Well, 
the pull loop and you know setting uh, setting this limit here and also setting a time limit within we which we have to process that finite set of records uh, serves as a proxy for us. It gives us an idea of how our consumers are performing and if they're still alive, right? Because this is where you could go rogue, right? <laughs> Uh, whatever business logic that you are implementing, you could be making a ton of external calls um, that could be failing, right, if you're not monitoring things properly. And then your consumer could be hanging. It could be that your consumer maybe is dead, maybe it will never actually get a response, um, be able to finish processing those records. And how would the consumer group coordinator know when to actually pull the plug, right? Um, and so by saying, we need to process a finite set of records within a finite amount of time, and if we don't do that within that finite amount of time, then, all right, maybe you're not healthy. Maybe we should move on. Maybe we should revoke you from the group uh, and give your partitions to someone else, right? Um, so this is the way that the cluster still tries to make progress and make sure that our consumers aren't just hanging, okay? Um, so again, so max pull interval is the amount of time uh, that, that, that that consumer has to fully process the amount of records from max pull records and try to pull again. So by default, you have to pull 500 records at most and um, you have five minutes to process them, okay? Um, so there are other time limits that will affect, it's not just if you miss this, um, you're revoked from the group, okay? There's other session timeouts, there are heartbeats that the consumer is still sending back uh, to the consumer coordinator to show that we are healthy, but this is just one of those timeouts that could affect whether or not your uh, uh, membership in that group is revoked, okay? Um, and so, yeah, so we are, um, we have the result of the fetch that comes back, and then we are pulling at the top of those the every pull loop. Uh, we are exhausting some of the records from the cache, and then we'll make another pull later on. Okay. So now, as we are processing these records, uh, these fetched and then pulled records, uh, we should probably keep track of whether or not we've actually processed that record, right? If we did what we were supposed to do and if we've made any progress, um, so that the next time a consumer comes online for this group, for this topic partition, we know where we left off with those offsets that we saw earlier, right? And we do that with committing, okay? Um, so committing our offsets, this can be an automatic process. Uh, it is an automatic process by default. Um, so when enable auto commit is set to true, um, behind the scenes we have an offsets handler that is committing our processed offsets, uh, our progress every five seconds. Okay, um, but you can change that commit interval using auto commit interval ms. Um, but keep in mind that this commit interval, um, it's, it's only a time-based interval, right? There's no way to explicitly configure easily um, commit after every five records or commit after every single record, right? Not with uh, the default committing. Um, but if you do want to guarantee that you commit after every record, which you're free to do that, um, you can manually commit your offsets uh, using consumer commit. Um, but this would definitely kill your performance. I don't recommend it. <laughs> um, so um, the, uh, the auto commit is usually good enough in like tweaking that and the time frame. And from here, we wash, rinse, and repeat, right? Uh, we're going to continue polling uh, from the poll iteration, fetching the uh, max poll uh, records, processing those, committing those. When we exhaust the cache um, of fetched records, we will then issue another fetch request uh, for more records from those to topic partitions, all right? So as long as uh, you know, that keeps operating, as long as our consumer continues to issue heartbeats um, to the consumer group coordinator and we are pulling within that uh, max poll interval, um, that great. We can operate this way indefinitely. Um, and even if a consumer client does fail, right, which it probably will at some point, uh, we can rest assured that whatever partitions it had are going to be reassigned to some other running consumer, um, and, and we're going to be completely fine, right? Good. Wonderful. Um, all right, so I know, <laughs> I know I just bombarded you over the last 40 minutes uh, with a very dense amount of information, um, but I hope that it wasn't too overwhelming, maybe just a little bit. Um, I know it's, it's a lot to process, and I hope certainly that it doesn't discourage you from um, learning more <laughs> about Kafka internals. Um, I think it's a fascinating technology. It's a very intricate, uh, deeply connect complex, and oftentimes um, very hard to understand. Um, but my opinion, um, in my opinion, you know, how intricate it is just makes me excited to learn more about the black box. Um, and there is an upside to this knowledge for you, right? That uh, you don't have to treat the black box like a black box, okay? I know you have all these incentives not to, uh, to you know, think about what's happening inside the box, um, but as we saw here, you can actually dive in. You can look at all of these metrics. You can tweak and pull all of these levers uh, to affect how these things are processed uh, along the way for every stage of the journey, right? 
And so this also means that the next time that something does go wrong, and it will go wrong, right? That all, something always happens. Um, something's going to go wrong with your consumers, with your producers. Um, rather than being annoyed and frustrated and walking away and just being angry for you know, two weeks while you try to debug it or get the metrics, um, now you know about these hidden internal processes, right? You know just a little bit more about the metrics that you can use to monitor every stage of the way and some of the configs that you can pull. Um, and so I hope that that debugging process, uh, the next time it occurs, um, it just makes your experience that much better, right? You don't know what you don't know, and now you do know, so it's on you. That's maybe stressful, but uh, it's a good thing. Um, and I also hope this inspires you to check into other internals, right? Uh, so you almost can't tell that I changed the slide, but now, same thing happens on the producer, <laughs> right? All of the requests that come through the brokers are gonna flow through the exact same process, um, you know, with a slightly different thing going on in the IO threads, and purgatory. Um, and I actually spent a lot of time over the past year, if you've seen some of my other talks, focusing a lot on producer internals. Um, so if you are curious, you can find those recordings online if you want to dive deeply uh, in the same way into what happens on the producer side of things. I encourage you to check it out. And on that note, I really, I really genuinely don't hope that, I hope that this isn't the last time you think about producer internals, right? Um, promise me, everybody, promise me. Um, so here's my link tree. Um, in it, you'll find resources on you know, things that I find are interesting or projects that I'm currently working on, which I also find interesting. Um, and most importantly, there's a link in there to Confluent Developer, which is our developer portal. Um, on there, we have hundreds of tutorials, uh, free demos, and dozens of free courses um, from basic to advanced, um, including some uh, internals uh, similar to this. Um, so yeah, I really encourage you to check it out if you have time and um, continue on in your Kafka journey. Right. Um, so on that, I will leave this up, but I do have uh, maybe a minute or two for questions if anybody has them. So thank you so much. <laughs>